Hello and welcome to the Exotic Pet Collective. My name is Richard. Thank you for joining me today. In today's episode, we'll be talking about something that is uh, kind of controversial. Uh, not so much controversial as embarrassing, I guess would be a better way of putting it. I think it's something that happens to a whole lot of people, but not many people talk about it. Maybe they're afraid of just admitting they made a mistake or they're worried about the criticism they may receive. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on the grenade here and I'm going to talk about my experiences. But first... We need to thank the sponsor of today's podcast, and that is Tarantula Cribs. If you're looking for a top-of-the-line acrylic enclosure for your tarantulas, isopods, scorpions, centipedes, whatever invertebrate you may have, I highly suggest you check out Tarantula Cribs. Currently, they are only shipping in the U.S., so no international sales, but they are amazing enclosures. I am using a whole lot of them for all different sizes, for all different types of inverts, and so far I've had zero complaints. And if you use the code TCollective10 at checkout, you will receive 10% off your entire order. So head on over to tarantulacribs.com. Tell them that the Tarantula Collective sent you. Use that code, get your discount, and upgrade your enclosures today. So one question I get a lot, and it seems people are constantly sending me messages, like whether it's on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, like, Every day I wake up and I've got 20 or 30 or maybe 100 messages from people from all over the world asking me a wide variety of things. You know, what species they should get? Is there a tarantula about to molt? Some people want me to identify what species they have or, you know, determine what sex their tarantula is. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to, you know, or expertise to answer a lot of those questions. I usually just refer people to the Facebook group, you know, kind of use the collective conscious there. Post your question, post the pictures and you know, there's, there's hundreds, there's thousands of people in those groups. So somebody is inevitably going to be able to help you out and answer a lot quicker and probably a lot more accurately than I would. Yeah. One question that keeps coming up a lot though, is, you know, people that have lost the tarantula, you know, or maybe a scorpion or, you know, whatever. And, and they're not really sure what to do. And, you know, it, it's something that most people don't like to admit to. Uh, they're, they're afraid of being criticized or, you know, it's just embarrassing. People don't like making mistakes and then, you know, being vocal about it. So I feel like there's a lack of information out there about how to recover a lost tarantula or if it's just gone and, and you'll never see it again. So today I'm just going to share my experiences with uh, losing tarantulas, you know, and how and if I've been able to, uh, you know, find them and get them back into an enclosure. So I think the first place we got to look at is, you know, how they escape. Uh, one of the main ways that I've noticed, like in my own collection and hearing from others, uh, tarantulas have escaped their enclosure is essentially just using a a bad enclosure. There's a lot of enclosures out there that, you know, are made for reptiles or, you know, fish, you know, it, we use a lot of different types of enclosures to keep tarantulas in because up until recently, there was really no enclosures made specifically for inverts. And, uh, one thing I think a lot of people use is just like the cheapest glass aquarium with a, a wire mesh lid. It seems like, you know, it, it would work if, if you don't have much experience with tarantulas. I think a lot of people have used those. And, you know, you don't, maybe you just don't consider the fact that tarantulas do have some strength and can push those lids up. And uh, I think that some people have fallen in that trap of thinking the lid itself is heavy enough to keep the tarantula in, not realizing it can, you know, climb the glass and, and wedge itself in between the lid and the aquarium and push that sucker off. And, uh, you know, that's definitely one way I've seen a lot of tarantulas escape. Also, uh, you know, with those wire mesh, if you have an adult tarantula, it's very possible that they could chew through that thin wire mesh. You know, if, if the tarantula is determined to get out, especially if it's a male or something wanting to wander, it's going to chew through that pretty easily, you know, with like in a night while you're sleeping, it could chew through that and escape and, and be loose in your house. And then of course, you know, there's, there's the, something I've experienced are the acrylic enclosures that we buy from like the container store and places like that. You know, you may buy it and the lid fits very snugly, but you know, after time, after you're taking it off and putting it on, taking it off, it, it really kind of wears down. And it just is loose, you know, and it makes it very easy to pop off, especially if, you know, a tarantula just pushes on it a little bit. You know, you see tarantula have escaped the, that way as well. And recently I saw some people post some pictures online of the uh, acrylic enclosures that have the circle vent um, that's kind of a wire mesh that juveniles have actually chewed through and gotten out. You know, whether they're post litharia or some other arboreal species, uh, kind of surprised me. I didn't, I didn't think that uh, tarantulas that small would have the strength uh, and their fangs would be hard enough to really cut through that wire. But I mean, it's, I've seen more than one. So I know that's definitely a thing. 
And it kind of worries me because I have some HMAX in enclosures just like that, which I'm probably going to be rehousing later on today after this podcast. But probably the the most embarrassing, <laughs> the most uh, unnerving reason that a tarantula escapes is because we just don't lock the enclosure back up. You know, whether we're feeding or watering them, or, you know, just doing some maintenance, rehousing, you know, a lot of a lot of the enclosures have, um, you know, like a little latch on the door. If you're using like an Exoterra or Zoomed enclosure that will lock it back into place or you get the screen locks that you put on the lid. I mean, there's there's all kinds of different ways to, you know, lock up that enclosure, make sure that lid is tight and secure. And sometimes we just forget. I had a, an Acanthoscuria geniculata in a uh, 12 by 12 by 12 Exoterra cube enclosure. And uh, I, I, I shut the doors, but I didn't latch it back. So the tarantula just, I guess, during the night walked up and pushed on the door and it just opened and it climbed right out. So it took me a couple of days to, to track that guy down and get him back in his enclosure. So it's definitely something that happens, you know, usually from a lack of mindfulness, not paying attention to what you're doing, um, you know, just, or, you know, we forget things happen. Uh, it, it sucks. It's dangerous for, you know, the tarantula more than anything, but it, you know, it, it happens and, you know, it's something that we, we should really kind of, you know, talk about <laughs> and discuss and, 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 you know, get to the bottom of this. So one thing that I've, I've done over time is, uh, usually at night, before I go to bed, I, I kind of do my, I call it my jailer rounds where I come downstairs and just kind of check in on everybody, make sure, you know, nobody's like completely out of water. Uh, and I, and I ensure that all my uh, enclosures are, you know, shut down tight. I make sure all the latches are locked, all the screen clips are on and in place. And you know, nobody is, uh, pushing the lid up on their acrylic enclosures or trying to chew through anything. Yeah, it takes less than a few minutes. You know, I just kind of come down and visually inspect everything, make sure it's all nice and tight. And it's something, you know, maybe you can't do every night, but it definitely it is. Uh, it'll put your mind at ease. But even if you can't do it every night, it is important to at least do it the nights that uh, maybe you did some rehousings or feeding or watering. Just, you know, go behind yourself, double check and make sure everybody is locked back uh, and, and, is, and is safe and secure in their enclosures. All right, so let's say you forgot. You didn't do that. Your tarantula got out and it's escaped and it's somewhere in your house and you need to know how to find it. And that seems to be where most people uh, kind of get panicked and, and will post stuff on Facebook or, or Instagram or something or, you know, what's more, I guess more likely is they'll send private messages, uh, you know, to me or, or somebody else saying like, what can I do? How can I find this tarantula? So, uh, you know, the first thing that I do uh, when I, I lose a tarantula is I start right around the enclosure. I determine how did it get out? Sometimes, uh, I've, I've noticed it, my experience and, and, um, you know, just talking to other people that you think your tarantula is gone and really it's just hiding very well. So the first thing I do is, uh, if I think a tarantula has escaped is I take that enclosure, uh, I bring it over to my table and I'll put it in a bin and we'll just slowly empty out all of the substrate, all the decorations, everything as, as carefully as I can and kind of just spread it out very, very thin in that little plastic tub. I guess it's kind of a big plastic tub. <laughs> and, and that way I can make sure that maybe it just didn't burrow down deep and it's hiding. Because they can be, you know, when they're trying to, you know, just kind of escape and, and uh, you know, hide, you know, they, they can be very uh, hard to find. You know, you won't even see that there's a burrow down there. And sometimes they won't even move, even when you're pulling the substrate out. They'll just, they'll be silent, you know, so playing possum or whatever. So I always make sure that I go through that substrate with a fine tooth comb and, you know, really kind of verify that the tarantula is no longer in the enclosure anywhere. You know, check underneath the cork bark. I mean, anywhere that a tarantula could cling to and hide, you got to inspect that. And then I'll, I will leave everything in that tub and put a lid on it so that it's secure, just in case I miss the tarantula. And it was like just spread out real thin somewhere, hiding in a corner, and I missed it. I don't want to leave it in something that's just wide open. So, you know, that, that way, it, if it had, even though it hadn't escaped, it could escape at that point. So I put a lid on it. And I set that aside and then I start from, you know, where that enclosure was and, and I start working outward. And I think, you know, it, it really depends on what type of uh, tarantula is missing. I think what I see the most of is uh, spiderlings because they're so tiny. A lot of people get their spiderlings in the mail. They make their own enclosure, whether it's a dram file or, you know, an acrylic box or something like that. And you don't think of just how small that tarantula is. Now, if a tarantula is only like a quarter of an inch, you know, I, in my experience, I try not to drill any holes in there more than like uh, half their size, you know, maybe even smaller. Yeah. It's, 
the tarantula can kind of squeeze through any hole that's, uh, you know, about the size of its carapace, which, you know, is, is about half or maybe even less than, you know, the, the size of the tarantula when you're measuring it by diagonal leg span. So I've had a few very, very tiny slings squeeze out of ventilation holes. I didn't think was possible, I, I, but you know, once I kind of looked at it a little bit closer, I was like, yeah, I should have seen that coming. And you know, it's, it's frustrating and it's scary because they're so small. They look like little house spiders and you know, it, it, you don't know if you're ever going to find them again. And some of these spiderlings can be very expensive. So, you know, the first step in preventing an escape, I guess, would be, you know, use very small ventilation holes. Uh, one thing I like to do is just take a thumbtack and, uh, or, you know, go to the hardware store by the smallest drill bit I can find. But, you know, sometimes they don't have ones that small. So I'll just get a thumbtack, heat it up and just, and kind of melt the plastic into little tiny holes. You know, if you're using a dram vial, you can really even get away with just poking holes in the plastic lid. You know, a tarantula doesn't do a whole lot of breathing. And, you know, you, essentially my philosophy is as long as I'm opening up that enclosure, um, you know, every few days, getting some air exchange in there, it should be plenty. I worry more about humidity and stagnant air building up than, you know, the tarantula not getting enough oxygen. All right. But say you didn't do that and your little spiderling got away. Um, now, it, I keep mine in a little spiderling nursery. So their enclosure is kind of inside of a large enclosure. It's like a 20 gallon fish tank or something that I, Kind of keeps sealed up with some air ventilation, uh, but just kind of, you know, kind of keep the humidity and heat a little bit higher than the rest of my house. So if I have a spiraling escape, that's, that's the first place I look. I pull out each enclosure that's inside that little uh, micro habitat, inspect the bottom sides, anywhere a tarantula could be clinging onto, pull all that stuff slowly out, set it on the table, check all the corners and, you know, any little, um, just any little cracks or crevices that that tarantula could be hiding in. You know, and, and then, it really helps to use a flashlight because sometimes it, I'll think it's a speck of dirt or something, a little clump of uh, substrate, and it, and that is actually a tarantula just curled up in a ball. So, you know, use a flashlight, check all the corners, nooks, and crannies, and, and then just start slowly working out. Like, I, I will start, um, if, if I don't see it inside there, I'll look at the tops and sides and bottoms of that, and then the enclosures on the shelves above or below. You know, if you don't have a huge collection like mine, just whatever's on the shelves, you know, above or below that enclosure. Now, typically, I kind of use the uh, the mindset that terrestrial fossorial tarantulas are going to move down and arboreal tarantulas are going to move up or sideways. So it's, you know, if, if I got a, a, a terrestrial tarantula, like a Brocky Pelma that's escaped its enclosure, a little, you know, baby spiderling, I'll just start slowly moving down the shelves or, you know, whatever is in between uh, where that enclosure was and the floor and look in every little nook and pull out books, do everything, you know, like do a thorough inspection until I get all the way down to the floor. And then once I'm on the floor, I go around the perimeter of the room. Uh, it seems that, you know, when tarantulas are stressed out, they like to find somewhere they feel secure and somewhere they can hide. So, uh, you know, I go uh, I'll, where the floor meets the wall, all around the baseboard, especially the corners of the rooms, and pull out anything that's in the way, couches, bookshelves, you know, whatever. I pull it out and, and kind of visually inspect all those nooks and crannies. Now, of course, if it's a... Uh, if it's an arboreal tarantula, then I'm looking on the walls. I'm pulling everything off, checking the walls, and, you know, looking especially at the very top corners. It's something I actually do pretty much every time I come down into my basement. I turn the lights on, and I do a visual sweep of the room real quick. I check all the corners, and, and the way my basement's laid out, I got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know, like 10 corners in this room, 12 corners, something like that. So I just kind of look at the top corners um and just see if there's any you know anybody hanging out there because you know I, you never know but i feel like if a tarantula is going to escape especially an arboreal that's that's probably where they'll they'll end up i mean you know you see all kinds of pictures and videos of people that had an escaped tarantula and and that's where they found it like up on the top of the wall right by the ceiling so you know i always check that out um pull out the you know uh, other enclosures and stuff because I did have a, a Vicularia that escaped at work. I just didn't shut the lid all the way to where it latched and it was able to just kind of push it back open, crawled out, went behind its enclosure and it only went about five feet away, but it was still clinging to the wall, hiding behind some books. So when I pulled the books off the shelf, there it was just kind of standing there and I was able to, to safely cup it up and, and get it back in its enclosure. So if, you, if, if you're you know looking for your tarantula, that's that's usually the first thing I do. I start where that enclosure was and start circling out, um, you know, in all directions, especially focusing, you know, downward for terrestrials and, and upwards or laterally for arboreals. 
And if and if you don't have any luck, you know it's it's frustrating. It's scary, uh, especially if it's an old world tarantula that's loose in your house. What I started doing then is um, I, I just look at where it it would what would be a good place for a tarantula to hide and feel secure. So at that point, I start checking shoes. I start checking inside my closets, uh, flipping my tables and couches over, seeing if it's in you know underneath there anywhere. Yeah, pretty much anywhere that a tarantula could could I just it's going to be dark, maybe a, a little warm, quiet, and not have uh, you know a whole lot of air movement. Just somewhere that would you know I think a tarantula would feel safe. Uh, you know that's where I start looking. You know, so I grab my flashlight and just start flipping over tables and looking underneath bookshelves and and any anything that I can. Uh, if if a credit card can slide in between it, that's kind of what I use. I mean, I know that's probably not you know the best advice, but if I can slip a credit card through it. I will check inside there and see if my tarantula had have you know has made its way in there. But sometimes you know you do all of that stuff and you still can't find the tarantula. Um, you know you've looked everywhere. You know it's not in its enclosure. Uh, you can't find it anywhere in the room. You don't you don't know what to do. And you know I had that happen um, not too long ago. You know it's, and it's one of those ways that I, mean, I didn't discuss at the beginning of the podcast like ways that a tarantula can escape. Um, I, I focus mostly on uh, human hair and screwing up and, and not doing, you know, not locking things back or, or having appropriate enclosures. But, you know, there's also the possibility, like, if you have cats or dogs or any other animal that, you know, moves around, sometimes they can be jerks, like cats are jerks. And uh, I've seen it so many times, you know, online that people are talking about their cats knocked an enclosure off. Like, I, my cat did that once as well. Had one kind of sitting on a shelf uh, close to the edge and... I don't even think it intentionally knocked it off. It would probably was just like jumped up there to look at another tarantula in its enclosure. And when it jumped down, it, it just kicked it off the shelf. And it was a uh, Gramostola rosea male. So, you know, I, I heard a noise. I came downstairs. I saw the enclosure had fallen. It was only like a shelf up. But, you know, it, so it, it didn't like damage the spider. But I heard it. And when I came down here, the substrate was uh, all over the floor and it was cracked. And I couldn't find the spider anywhere. And I'm checking my cat. Because my first thought was my cat ate it. <laughs> and uh, he was fine. Mr. Bo had no problems. You know, I didn't even uh, notice any urticating hairs like in his mouth or eyes or anything. He didn't, he didn't seem to be bothered at all. So I don't know if he just maybe didn't even, didn't even see the spider. Like he just knocked the enclosure over, heard the noise and took off running to hide. And um, I looked everywhere for days for that tarantula. I could not find it. And uh, this also happened, I had an Acanthus and in Aculata I mentioned earlier. When it escaped, it took me, you know, a few days to find that one. And I looked everywhere, everywhere I could think of, and it, it never appeared. And, you know, it's kind of difficult for me because not only do I have all these enclosures and shelves, but, you know, my kid's got a bunch of his toys and, you know, a, little, a TV and couch on the other side of the basement where, you know, it's kind of his little area where he can play games. I've got all this camera equipment and like every mic stand and mic and lens and uh, light stands, like everything has its own little black uh, bag, you know, for like traveling. So I had to go through all those little black bags and look inside them. And yeah, it took me hours and never found anything. It was very frustrating. And then it seemed like, I don't know, two or three days later, I'm on the unfinished side of the basement doing laundry. And in both cases, you know, I mean, and these are the years apart. But I, I was doing laundry and I just see the tarantula kind of walk across the floor. And I was like, what? it's the middle of the day. It had been days since it had gotten out. And uh, like in, with the case of the um, the rose hair tarantula, it was pretty dehydrated. And in fact, I think that one is probably gone for 10 days, 12 days. I had like written it off as dead. I was like, if the cats didn't kill it or the fall didn't kill it, um, you know, then just exposure it was going to kill it because it's cold and it didn't have uh, access to water. Uh, or food and you know I just I couldn't imagine that it was going to live very long on its own especially with two cats running around the house and two dogs and but you know nobody bothered it apparently it had just uh, crawled under my desk or something like that and just worked its way along the wall behind all of the furniture and stuff and got into the other side of the basement and you know once it's over there <laughs> so much stuff on that side of the basement there, there was no way I was going to be able to find it but luckily it came out in the open. I was able to, to capture it and put it up. So, you know, that's something that uh, I, I'm going to suggest if you've lost your tarantula and you've torn your room apart looking for it, uh, then just start, you know, following a path that you would, you know, I mean, we have, we, we know how tarantulas act. We see them in their enclosures, uh, the way they behave, you know, they're not going to be walking really 
like just down the middle of the road in most cases they're they're going to be kind of hugging the walls and stuff like that so you know i i i would suggest checking the baseboards in your hallways leading to other rooms just kind of you know just get yourself in the mindset of how a tarantula would be moving and this applies to scorpions and stuff like that as well but if you uh if you can't find it you've been looking what i do uh, or not, and what i suggest to people is to remember that tarantulas are nocturnal. A lot of their movement happens at night. So I would, you know, come down at midnight or something like that, not even turn on the lights, just very quietly walk into the room, turn on a flashlight, kind of look around, see if I could find it. You know, maybe come back at like two or three o'clock in the morning after everybody's been in bed and sleeping for a while. You know, tarantula feels safe. There's not a whole lot of noise. There's no light. It, you know, it, it may be more apt to come out of hiding. So, you know, grab your flashlight and try looking for it then. And, you know, something else that, maybe uh, a possibility I've, I've seen some people talk about doing it i don't know how successful it's been but uh they put an enclosure on its side with substrate water uh hide stuff like that and kind of leave it in the middle of the floor hoping that the tarantula will come across it and find it and think well that's a safe place to hang out so i'm, I'm just going to chill there you know and they just kind of kind of like a little tarantula trap and and hopefully it will attract the tarantula and it'll be all good i have not tried that myself um, but I've heard other people try it or say they were going to try that. I don't know if it actually works or not. It seems people that have done that, you know, I guess end up stumbling across a tarantula somewhere else. But it, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's frustrating when a tarantula escapes, you know, you're beating yourself up. You're wishing you could like redo whatever it was you did the day before that enabled that tarantula to escape. Uh, you know, but there's, there's really, there's obviously no way of going back in time. All we can really do is learn from our mistakes and not repeat them. You know, I, I will keep searching for a tarantula until I find it, dead or alive. Um, you know, I always try to stay optimistic that, you know, maybe it's just hiding somewhere. And, and at least, you know, in my basement, so many crickets escape while I'm trying to feed the other tarantulas that are in enclosures. I have a feeling there's probably, you know, plenty of live crickets <laughs> in, you know, just kind of roaming around my basement that they may be able to find something to eat. And uh, so far, any tarantula that's escaped uh, adult juvies or adults i've i've been able to find um but i did have a oh man i can't even remember what it was it was a black amelia tarantula and it was like less than an eighth of an inch it was a tiny little speck of a spiraling that crawled out of a ventilation hole that was too small and is just gone and i assume that it i mean that was years ago <laughs> i haven't seen any juvies or adult tarantulas walking around so you know it more than likely did not survive uh, especially spiderlings because they're so vulnerable they really need to have that you know warm temperature and uh you know kind of high moisture high humidity environment and you know when when they're just wandering around your house they, they probably aren't they're, they're just going to die of exposure they're going to dehydrate more than likely uh or they're going to get stepped on or eaten by you know some larger spider or you know some other living animal that's in your house that you know feeds off inverts so, you know, when you leave, lose a spiderling, if you can't find it within, you know, a couple of days, it's it's probably not looking very good. Adult tarantulas seem to be able to survive a little bit longer. Just kind of keep an eye out for them, and, you know, uh, and, and check weird places. Like, that's all I can, can really harp on is, you know, it, the darkest place that, you know, you have, you've never even really looked in or considered is, is a high probability of where a tarantula is going to hide. You know, like I had one in my uh, table back here that I should do a lot of uh, filming from like my videos on underneath it, like where the legs are, there's like a little divot, you know, like kind of like a, a cross piece of wood with a screw screw into, into the leg, you know, and, and a tarantula loves, you know, whenever they escape the table and go running down the side, they, that's usually where they go straight forward. You know, they, they kind of see that dark little crevice and, and shoot right up in there. So, you know, look under like in the legs of tables, if that makes sense, like where the table the leg kind of connects gets screwed into the table sometimes you know they can fit up in there and i've had people uh most recently someone sent me a message i think they were doing a rehousing or something like that and they were doing it in their bathroom and the tarantula escaped and went down the drain of the sink and they were like how do i get it out and i'm like apart from taking the the plumbing apart i don't i don't really know get under your sink and, and unscrew that get that pipe out of there but you know it, it's that's one of the reasons I don't rehouse in bathrooms. Like I've, that used to be kind of um, a su highly suggested method, you know, take the tarantula into your bathtub and, you know, kind of just get it from one enclosure into the, the new enclosure. And that way, if it escapes, it's going to be trapped in the bathtub. But 
it, that has never really made sense to me because there's so many, you know, you got, you got a, you know, your toilet and your sink and, and the tub itself has a drain. If that's not, that, that doesn't have some kind of grate on it. If it's just an open drain, you know, even if it's just like a little stopper in there, that's kind of lifted up the trash can get down in there, you know, and, and it would be next to impossible to get it out. Uh, and I've also seen uh, people talk about the tarantula escaping during a rehouse and running up the, the side of the shower on, onto the ceiling and then into the fan, like into an exhaust fan or, or into the lights or something like that. So it's, it, it, to, I don't rehouse them in, in the bathroom because I don't want them to go, you know, escaping the drain or, you know, getting, you know, in, in a cabinet. Uh, it just, it just seems like there's a lot of places for it to hide, but most importantly, because yeah, maybe it's just the way my bathroom is. I don't feel like I have um, as much room to move around. Like I'm kind of like trapped in that one little area. And if I can't react fast enough, it gets away. It's, it's going to be a pain in the butt, uh, you know, to try to capture it. So that's why I do mine in like the largest open space that I have, which usually is down here in the basement. Now, if, if it does escape, it has a long way to travel before it hits a wall. <laughs> you know? So I try to go in areas that are most wide open, have the most visible space. That's why I'm able to move a lot faster. You know, I don't want to confine myself in a tiny little bathroom with a tarantula, you know, but even then when they escape, you know, one of the things that I, I highly suggest, I know everybody highly suggests is, is obviously have a catch cup, but I have multiple catch cups. I'll have one kind of right by me where it is that I'm doing the rehousing. Um, but then I'll put some, you know, on the floor, you know, kind of further away from me. So if it does escape, you know, I, I wherever it, it starts running to, there's usually a catch cup nearby. So I'll have two or three of those just kind of uh, spread out around the room. But yeah, it's it's no fun when the tarantula escapes. It's embarrassing. It's frustrating. And sometimes it's expensive. You know, if you paid hundreds of dollars for your species and it escaped, um, you know that that's a sickening feeling. Not did you only not only did you just lose your pet, um, and and there's a possibility you're never going to find it, but there's also that monetary uh, side of it that, you know, it just wasted hundreds of dollars. So, you know, the, the best way to avoid uh, tarantulas escaping is prevention, obviously. Uh, you know, one thing that I have done myself, uh, some of my uh, acrylic plastic um, enclosures for like terrestrial spiderlings or juveniles, really, they're, they're juvenile enclosures that I use a lot because I've had them now for years and have rehoused, you know, a lot of tarantulas. They'll outgrow them and I'll clean them up, uh, set them up and, and move a new tarantula into them. The, the, the lid has just really gotten loose. So, you know, I, and I, it's not the best idea, but I use uh, what's called gaff tape. It's something I didn't even really know about until I started you know, making YouTube videos and got really into photography. And it's, uh, it's kind of like duct tape, um, but they use it a lot because it's strong it sticks to pretty much everything, but it also peels off pretty easily. It doesn't leave like a really sticky residue like duct tape would. You know, I, I've tried painter's tape and it just didn't, it, it didn't stick long enough. It didn't really hold on there. You know, after like a couple of weeks or a couple of months, it started drying out and, and the tape would peel. Duct tape is obviously too strong. <laughs> and it's like you, you put that on there and now you've marred that acrylic uh, for life. And then you pull it off and it's going to leave this really nasty sticky residue. But uh, gaff tape has been working really well for me. It's G A F F. It's, um, something they use a lot. Uh, I mean, in a lot of different areas, but in a lot in photography and videography work, um, you know, if you ever like go to a concert or something like that and you see like all the wires running from speakers and lights and stuff like that, they're on the ground and they have this black tape that's kind of like holding them down, <laughs> like so people don't trip on them. That's gaff tape because it's going to, you know, you, it takes a beating. It's going to stay stuck to whatever floor it is, you know, whether it's carpet, hardwood concrete whatever but when it's time to wrap up they can just peel it right off and and it doesn't damage the floor so it's it's good to go and i've been using that i just take a little piece of it put it on both sides of the plastic lid to really kind of latch it down onto the enclosure and that way no tarantula can push it off and you know of course i, I don't put it over air vents because if the tarantula were to stick its legs through that air vent a little air hole uh, it could get stuck on the sticky side of the tape. So, you know, I just do it where it's solid, solid part of the lid, solid part of the side of the enclosure. And so far it's been working really well. Uh, I even had a, I even did a rehouse a few days ago and I pulled that tape off that had been on there for months. Absolutely no residue. It peeled off pretty easily. And, uh, and I, I was amazed now, of course, because it's, I, I just raved about it so much. It, it, I should say that it's going to cost a lot more than duct tape. I mean, you can go to like the hardware store, get a roll of duct tape for like a buck. 
I think gaff tape sells on Amazon for like $10 or something for a big roll of it, but it's worth the investment. I mean, I use it all the time, not just, uh, for tarantula enclosures. I, I use it to hang lights and, and wrap up cords and I'm just constantly using the stuff. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. So, you know, check that out. Uh, get some gaff tape. Uh, if, if you need to tape the lids on some of your plastic enclosures, but you know, if, if that's the case, uh, you could also just sometimes you just got to throw away an enclosure. Like it's just not going to be good anymore. You got to toss it and, and go out and get a new one that has a secure fitting lid or, you know, like check out our sponsor of today's podcast, Tarantula Cribs. They've got uh, some amazing acrylic enclosures. They look really good. But the reason I like them the most is because the way their lid works on like a sliding lid on some of their enclosures, uh, it, it's actually kind of goes into track, like this like track system. You know, it's like this, it slides in between two other pieces of acrylic. So it's it's really in there tight. And then it has some very strong magnets that hold it into place. So, you know, no, no tarantula is going to be pushing that out. Um, and, and you don't have to worry about it warping or, you know, it's, they're just great. They really thought about tarantulas escaping when they designed those. So, you know, sometimes you just got to upgrade your enclosure into something that's going to work a little bit better, you know, and if, if you're like me and you've got a lot of these exoterra enclosures, uh, or zoom Ed enclosures, it's a lot of work sometimes, but you, you know, you, and, you, and I'm saying this to myself more than to anybody listening, but you gotta, you gotta change out those, uh, thin wire mesh lids. You know, you, you gotta cut those out and replace them with acrylic. Uh, it's, it's not the most fun part of, you know, keeping tarantulas. I've done it to about half of my enclosures, which is saying a lot. Cause I mean, I probably have 20 or more, uh, it, but acrylics, it can be expensive and it can be uh, frustrating to work with and a hassle and, and you got to use aquarium safe silicone. And, but uh, that small amount of time and effort is going to pay off because a tarantula can't chew through that. And that is, uh, for me personally, I did it on my Pusillotherias first. You know, I looked at what tarantula has the most potent venom and uh, is maybe like the most offensive and the largest that I had. And those were the enclosures that I, I, I retrofitted the lids first. Uh, like my avicularias, I haven't got around to doing that on their enclosures, but it's it's on my list of things to do. You know, so, so be proactive. Switch out that wire mesh uh, with acrylic buy enclosures that are made for tarantula keeping, you know, or, you know, just kind of be critical of the enclosure you're using. Look at it and, and, and really consider is, is those ventilation holes, um, small enough? Like, is it, is it my spiraling or juvie going to be able to squeeze through that and escape? And if, if you're on the fence, you're like, eh, I'm not sure. Maybe then just don't use it. <laughs> throw that, throw that enclosure to the side and get one that you're confident it won't be able to escape from. And, you know, if you're, you don't have gaff tape and the enclosure lid is not, you know, if, if it's just not holding, it's, uh, it's not locking into place like it should, uh, you, you got to figure something out. You either got to get a new enclosure or you set something on top of it. And there's a lot of ways around it. Uh, one thing I don't suggest is rubber bands. I've seen people do that a lot. They'll wrap rubber bands around an acrylic enclosure to keep the lid on. But uh, in my experience, you know, tarantulas and scorpions are pretty strong. And if, uh, you know, if, if it's not really latched on there tight, and there is still a possibility it could push it up enough for it to, uh, to squeeze out. Uh, and, and then there's, you know, the fact that if it can push it up just enough to get its fangs around that rubber band a little bit, it could, it could bite right through that rubber band. And now you don't have a rubber band <laughs> and, uh, and they, and they dry out and they wear out and snap and break. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not the most effective way of doing it. So aside from preventing your tarantula from escaping in the first place, uh, once it does escape, like I mentioned earlier, just check all the nooks and crannies, all the dark spaces, use a flashlight. Don't be afraid to move things. Check all your shoes, you know, blankets, towels, all that kind of stuff. Anywhere it's nice and cozy, that trench can hide, you know, eliminate that as a possible place that it, it could go. And maybe even consider putting out a little water dish on the floor, you know, in the area you think it might be in. You, know, you can try what other people have tried and, and get an enclosure kind of like on its side so they could easily walk into it and make itself home. And just, you know, keep coming out every night, you know, when it's dark and quiet and looking around for it. But I think the most important thing and maybe the, the most difficult thing is to be honest and uh, tell the people that you're living with a tarantula has escaped. Like, it's not something I ever want to tell my wife. Like, I don't want her to know because <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. It just seems like it, it, I feel irresponsible. Like, I screwed up, you know, but you, you got to tell them because... If, you, if they know, if they're aware that there's a tarantula loose in your house or your apartment, 
they're going to have an eye open for it as well. And maybe they'll see it, you know, walk across the floor or in the corner, or, you know, on the ceiling or something like that and can alert you like, hey, you know, that, of course, there may be consequences, but you, you, you'll deal with those later. Right now, you, your main focus should be trying to find that tarantula. Um, and don't beat yourself up too much. You know, like I said, to, I feel like it, it happens to a whole lot of people and very few people ever talk about it. And the ones that do are subject, uh, you know, to all kinds of criticism. <laughs> Uh, just the nature of the internet, you know, people, you know, see someone make a mistake or see a flaw and they love to jump on it and criticize and ridicule and tell you you're a bad keeper and, and all that stuff. And, you know, it, it's not always human error. Sometimes it's, it's malfunctioning products, you know, the, the latch broke or, you know, this, the screen didn't fit securely. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that a tarantula could escape. I would say the majority of them is human error. And, you know, the best thing you can do is just, uh, you know, fess up to it. The unaddressed behavior repeats itself 100% of the time. So if you were making a mistake and you just ignore it and try to like sweep it under the rug, there's a hundred percent chance that mistake is going to repeat itself. And it, you know, so you, you gotta, you gotta hold yourself accountable. You gotta get honest, tell the people in your life, you know, that are living with you at least, uh, uh one of my tarantulas escaped, please keep an eye out for it or help me find it. Let me know if you see it. Um, you know, having multiple eyes is definitely going to help you out there. And, and uh, look at look at the situation. Like, what did I do wrong? How did this tarantula escape? Uh, because that's that, that's very important. If you don't determine how it escaped, then there's a pretty good chance that once you do find it, if you do find it, and put it back in that enclosure, it's going to escape again. Uh, or it could be an, a problem if you have multiple tarantulas. It, it could be an issue that you replicated across a lot of your enclosures. So if you can identify the issue with that one tarantula in that one enclosure, and how to fix it, then you can assess the, you know, all your other enclosures and see what it is you need to, to work on, how you need to secure these better. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, tarantulas don't escape very often. You know, I've got hundreds of species for, you know, many years. I can count on one hand the amount that have escaped. And two of those times were because I didn't lock the, I didn't latch the door back very well. Another one was because the ventilation hole was too big for the spiderling. So it's, it's, uh, it happens. It was in, in my experience, in my situation, it was 100% user error every time. And I beat the crap. Actually, it happened four times. I forgot. I had an Idiotheli uh, Mira escape. And that was because my acrylic enclosure, the lid just uh, was very easy for it to push off. And it just kind of pushed it open and, and crawled right out. <laughs> and uh, I actually found it in the dog's uh, water bowl or food bowl, something like that. I had like uh, some crates down here with empty dog bowls in it, I guess it crawled in and then wasn't able to like get back out. Uh, it kept sliding. So uh, it was easy to find, but yeah, actually my son found it. He was like, Hey, I think there's a tarantula in the dog's food bowl down here. And I was like, what? And I hadn't even realized that it had escaped, which was uh, a little concerning, but you know, it, what can you do? So I know it's a, it's a little shorter podcast today and it's, it's just me talking. I didn't have anybody else on this week. I had to do a little bit of rearranging, um, you know, like I mentioned in the live stream I had recently, had some major life changes here, uh, personally, financially, uh, I got laid off my job, so I'm focusing on this full time. And so like all of my, my schedules just really screwed up at the moment, trying to like, uh, get everything situated, uh, for, you know, essentially doing podcasts and YouTube full time. So one of the things I did was I completely cleaned my basement. Like I, uh, I moved all my shelves out, swept everything, pulled all the junk that collects, like, you know, under tables and stuff like that. I'm behind the couch and, and, and really kind of cleaned everything up as, as good as I could clean my desk, uh, cleaned all the drawers, reorganized all my camera equipment and, uh, tarantulas and just trying to get everything set up real nice. So if I, cause I'm, if I'm going to be doing this full time, I wanted to be as professional as possible. So I figured the first place to start was, uh, by cleaning and organizing everything. Uh, so, you know, that's, it took me like three days to do, but finally got everything, uh, for the most part, I'm like 90% there. I got everything kind of cleaned up and set up. So it's, I've been focusing on that more than making content, but I feel like once that's done, making content will be a lot easier. I can focus, you know, on, on batch shooting videos, getting like three or four videos shot at a time and recording multiple podcasts. And, and I got some exciting people lined up, uh, that are gonna be coming on soon. Uh, I've got, um, uh, Jess Arachnid's going to be coming on. Uh, she's a tarantula invert breeder out of Philadelphia. She'll be coming on talking uh, about breeding tarantulas, being a woman in the hobby, all that fun stuff. 
and got a couple other people that have podcasts uh, in the reptile world that will be coming on, uh, as well as like some medical people in the medical field and psychologists and scientists and researchers and all kinds of cool stuff happening in the near future. So make sure you're staying tuned uh, and, and you're you know following um, wherever you listen to podcasts. <laughs> you just follow the Exotic Pet Collective so you're alerted every time I upload one. Um, right now, it's just going to be uh, every Thursday. But you know, it's, uh, it's exciting. I'm, I'm nervous and I'm excited about doing uh, content creation full time. It's, it's weird because it's a, it's a small niche. You know, there's not a whole lot of uh, tarantula keepers out there, people that are interested in tarantula and invert content, but I think there are enough that I, I should be able to, uh, make a living. I mean, make better money than if I was, you know, working part time at a fast food restaurant or something. So, uh, and, and I think if I stick with it, and just continue to try and grow all these different platforms that in the long run, it'll pay off. You know, at least we'll have my own business and be my own boss and not have to work making some other guy rich and <laughs> why he pays me crap. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I appreciate all your all support and encouragement. It, it's been awesome. And, you know, huge shout out to Tarantula Cribs for supporting me through this and sponsoring, you know, YouTube videos and, and sponsoring the podcast and, you know, open it up to a whole lot of other uh, businesses that are in the tarantula or invert hobby. Uh, so, you know, there'll, there'll be other sponsors coming on in the near future, which is, is very exciting. It, and it's weird because it's, it's, um, you would, you would not believe the amount of, uh, emails that I get from random companies wanting to, you know, a, a sponsor a podcast or have an ad in a YouTube video. And they have absolutely nothing to do with tarantulas. They, they want me to like, uh, advertise their, their crappy, you know, freemium uh, mobile game or uh, some music listening software or, you know, stuff that's, it's, it's probably some kind of junk scam. I, I don't even know what, I've never heard of these products or the companies, but, you know, they're offering me a couple hundred dollars to to mention them in a 30 second ad in a video. And it's like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I'm trying to, to only accept advertisers or, um, you know, people that want to sponsor that, are somehow related to the tarantula hobby, you know, and, and are reputable. Like, I don't want to just advertise anybody. I want to make sure that they have a product that I can stand behind and, and, and I just won't be selling out to, to make a few bucks to pay my bills. So, uh, it, it may be tight for a little bit. Um, but I'm going to try and do this with as much integrity as possible and, and not just be you know, running ads for any random company that reaches out to me. And, you know, for everybody that's been sending me messages and stuff, um, I know that I'm not the best at replying to them. Uh, a lot of times they're just, uh, they're not even really questions. People are just like sending me pictures with updates about, you know, the personal collection and stuff. And a lot of those I read, um, you know, but I don't always respond to them. I get a lot, like I mentioned earlier, I get a lot of questions about uh, like people want me to identify their species. And, and I'm just going to say it here. Like I'm not a researcher, I'm not a biologist or arachnologist or, you know, anything like that. I'm, I'm just a hobbyist like everybody else. Like, you know, we're not everybody else, but like most of the people out there. So, I'll, you know, you send me a, a grainy picture of your tarantula and want me to identify its species, especially if it's like a brachypelma or, you know, some new world terrestrial. Like that can be kind of difficult, especially if it's like a low res photo. Uh, with bad lighting shot through cloudy glass, like it, it's difficult. And some of those brachypelma species, you, you really got to inspect them close, uh, you know, it, to, to determine what species it is. So if you send me those and I don't respond, um, it's usually because I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that is. And uh, I, I just didn't have the time to to write you and say, you know, post it in the Facebook group. And some people are afraid to, you know, like, like kind of like talking about having lost a tarantula. Uh, people are afraid to ask for help or admit that they don't know something. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you, there's a lot of things that I don't know. I'm not the best at determining the sex of a tarantula, especially ventrally. <laughs> and people like take a pictures of the underside of their tarantula. And they're like, is this male or female? It's like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I can't help you there. I'm sorry. Um, you know, or the worst, the worst, I'm just going to complain for a minute. Uh, are the people that, um, are asking for medical advice, you know, the, like, like I'm a veterinarian and you know, they, they have some horrible situation or their tarantula is sick or dying or, um, you know, it, it, they think it's in a death curl or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, of things that happen, uh, that people will stress out about. 
And, you know, they, they reach out to me like, hey, what do I do? How do I fix this? And it's like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I have not had experience with a tarantula that has been, you know, half smashed or had a couple legs ripped off or whatever. It's like, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to just make stuff up. If I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. Or I'm going to point you in a direction of somebody that can help you out. It's, uh, it's I, I don't know. I, I think it's important to, to put it out there multiple times and, and really remind people that I'm, I am a hobbyist. I enjoy keeping tarantulas and I enjoy telling people, you know, what information I do have, uh, you know, how I keep mine, but that, you know, it doesn't mean that I should be your only source. And it definitely doesn't mean that I am an expert, uh, in, in, in any way, shape or form. I did not go to school, uh, you know, for, for biology or arachnology, I, I, I don't have that background. Uh, I have, I'm not a researcher. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a veterinarian. I, I can't give you medical advice, you know, and, and with a good conscience, I just can't make up an answer and give it to you so that you feel better. Like, cause that's not helping anything. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues that come with keeping inverts. And if I have experience in that, in, you know, on that topic, I will definitely share it with you. But if I don't, um, there's not much I can do about that, except, you know, suggest maybe you talk to somebody that does and maybe uh, refer you to someone that I know has had a similar experience. Um, it, and it, I know people, you know, I'm not saying you should, you should already know this, but it's, it's when I tell people that and they get upset and insulting, <laughs> like just being dicks about it. It's like, hey, I, I don't know why you thought I was a veterinarian and would be able to answer your question. Like, uh, take it to the vet. That would be a good idea. If you, if you don't have the money to pay for vet bills, and this kind of is, is off the, because I guess most vets are, have nothing to do with inverts. But I mean, if you get a snake or a dog, I mean, you shouldn't bring that pet on unless you have the money to take it to the vet and get it the medical, um, you know, the medical treatment that it may inevitably will need. Uh, it's, it's um, I don't know. I get frustrated by that a lot. I don't mean to get on a soapbox there, but <laughs> when people are like, uh, yeah, my snake's sick, what do I do? It's like, I don't know take it to the vet and they're like well i can't afford to take it to the vet it's like well you, you probably shouldn't have got a snake then because uh, sometimes they get sick uh, sometimes there are issues and you need to take them to an exotic pet de- uh, uh, vet and it's expensive and i know it's not fun it's not the fun part of the hobby but it's the responsible part of the hobby and we need to make sure that as pet keepers especially exotic pet keepers that that we're being as responsible as possible and so uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna step away from that subject we'll, we'll save that for another podcast i didn't mean to get on a soapbox there but you know, I, I want to try, I, I guess what I was trying to say is that I'll, I'm going to be focused a lot more on trying to answer a lot of these messages. Uh, but, you know, if, if it's medical advice or, you know, something with like identifying species or sex or something like that, all of those, I'm, I'm just going to suggest you, you go to the Facebook group um, because, or Reddit. Uh, and that's why I created those two platforms uh, because I can't answer all those questions uh, because I don't know the answers to a lot of those questions. But I, what I can do is create a community full of a whole bunch of people that are available at any moment. Uh, I mean, we got like almost 20,000 people in the Facebook group. So I like at any moment, there's probably a couple thousand people that are active in the group. So, you know, you can make a post and there's a pretty good possibility, pretty good chance that somebody that's active that sees that post is going to be able to answer your question much faster and much more accurately than I can. Uh, Reddit's still growing. Uh, you can always check it out. It's just the Tarantula Collective subreddit. Uh, it not extremely active, but it's starting to grow. And, you know, so if you don't do Facebook, you can definitely do that there. And I'm sure it's not me. I've seen other uh, people also talk about that, the frustrations, uh, whether they're reptile YouTubers or other tarantula YouTubers. It's, uh, it, it's a little overwhelming sometimes, just the, uh, the amount and type of questions they get asked. Uh, you know, I try to put as much information out there that I can, that I know and I'm confident in. And even some of that, I'm, you know, I make mistakes. I, mean, I, I say things in videos that are not 100% true. Uh, and, I, and I don't learn until after I made that public statement, someone corrects me. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right. I made a mistake. Uh, next time I'm talking about this species in another video, I'll be sure to uh, make that correction. But, you know, it's, it's all learning. We're, we're constantly learning, constantly evolving. And we just we got to be responsible, open to suggestions and willing to admit when we make mistakes and, and try to correct those mistakes. And I guess that kind of brings us back full circle uh, to losing a tarantula because it's, it's not fun. It sucks. Uh, it's frustrating. And, uh, you know, I hate that it happens. Uh, but, you know, we really got to, you know, be responsible keepers 
and uh, not just put our tarantulas in, in, in any type of enclosure. We got to make sure it's a secure enclosure that, you know, because it not only is it bad, you know, uh, for our relationships, like if I lose a tarantula in the house, like if I were to lose a post Lotharia, my wife would be livid and, uh, would probably not be able to sleep until I found that spider and got it back in its enclosure. And, you know, if they have medically significant venom, it potentially could be dangerous. You know, if, if a OBT hides in somebody's shoe because it thinks it's nice, safe, and dark, and somebody puts their foot in there, it, it, it could get bit, and that could be very painful. So, you know, we, we got to be responsible. Um, but it's not just dangerous for the people in our lives that live in our homes. It, it's probably the most dangerous to the tarantulas. You know, it's... it's uh, just to leave in the enclosure, crawling out of a, an open lid or an open door. I mean, it, depending on where you have that enclosure, it could be a five, 10 foot drop. That in and of itself could be, you know, could kill a tarantula. Maybe not a 10 foot drop. I don't know why you would have your enclosure that high, but it could be like a two foot drop. That's what I meant to say. A two to five foot drop. That'd be a, that's a lot more reasonable. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's dangerous for the tarantula because it, there's just that fall coming out of the enclosure could be deadly. Um, being exposed to, uh, different insects in your house and pesticides and chemicals and lack of water, lack of food, dogs, cats, whatever, children <laughs> accidentally getting stepped on. Uh, it's, it's dangerous for them to be outside of their enclosure. And you know, that's on us as keepers. We got to make sure that they're, they're staying in there and we got to be willing maybe to, and it sucks, but at some point maybe we might have to get, just accept the fact that getting appropriate enclosures, uh, even though they are more expensive is maybe more responsible, you know? Um, and there are plenty of enclosures out there that work really well that are very cheap. Like, um, you know, love uh, Tupperware containers that have screw on lids, you know, that maybe they don't look the prettiest, but they're secure and people have been using them for many years and they're cheap, you know, buy like a, one of those big plastic barrels of uh, cheese poofs. I hear those make great arboreal enclosures. I have never used them uh, just cause I don't like the way they look, but I mean, like five bucks and you get to eat all the cheese poofs and then you have an enclosure you know so there, there are a lot of cheap and very inexpensive enclosures that you can find and use uh, but you know there's there's a lot of really bad enclosures out there like on amazon and stuff that say they're for tarantulas say they're for inverts and they're just cheap pieces of crap you know just plastic junk that they're selling for 10 bucks and you're like well you know this this enclosure is 10 bucks and this enclosure is 40 uh, i think the smart thing would be to get the ten dollar enclosure, but you know that that's the cheap thing to do. You're you're buying, you're just wasting that ten dollars. Like I bought a couple of those enclosures off of Wish, and they are junk. <laughs> I have not had any luck with them. They they break really easy. Uh, some of them you had to like use screws. They don't they're not watertight, so it's really hard to keep the substrate damp, and it's just it's a headache. Building it's a headache, and then maintaining it, it is a headache. Using it is a headache. Like. It's like, yeah, I should have, I should have just uh, taken that ten dollars and saved it until I had thirty dollars and bought an actual decent enclosure. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to wrap this up. Uh, but thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. I know this is a little bit rambling today. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of doing these podcasts by myself, but I didn't want to uh, not put out anything. So hopefully you listened and maybe enjoyed it. Maybe uh, learned something. I don't know. Maybe I just ranted for an hour and and you're like, what the hell was that? <laughs> But at any rate, I appreciate all your old support and listening to these podcasts and subscribing to the Exotic Pet Collective on YouTube uh, and the Tarantula Collective on YouTube. We just crossed 60,000 subscribers on my birthday, which is really exciting. Uh, couldn't have come at a better time. And, uh, you know, if you've got any suggestions for people you would like to hear on the podcast, because this podcast is mainly, its main goal is, is like the interview style, the conversation style, me and somebody else or a couple other people. So if there's, if you've got any suggestions of people you'd like to hear me uh, talk to, definitely, you know, leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube or send me an email at the exotic pet collective at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your suggestions or, you know, or just you know, leave a comment on any of my videos or um, any of my pictures on Instagram or, you know, send me a tweet at, uh, tweet at me. It's at the tarantula co one uh, or just search the tarantula collective. I'll come on, send me a tweet. Let me know. Give me suggestions, tag people. Uh, love to get all kinds of different people on here from, you know, all different areas of the exotic pet hobby. I think it's, it's going to be very exciting. And, you know, once COVID is, is under control and we can uh, move freely about the country, I've, uh, 
I mean, I've got everything set up to do mobile podcasts. Like uh, my little podcast uh, station here is actually battery powered and is mobile. And I've got two mics and everything I need to um, go somewhere and, and do a podcast with someone. So, I, you know, people don't have to come to my house. <laughs> and uh, I'm really looking forward to that, especially when we go up to like uh, reptile conventions and, and things like that. Be able to get like three or four podcasts recorded uh, at a time. So it's going to be awesome. There'll be a whole bunch of whole bunch of topics that we'll be discussing. So you know, stay tuned. Um, I, we, we haven't even broken twenty podcasts yet. So it's uh, we're learning, we're moving, we're growing. So I uh, I appreciate all your all support, everything you all been doing. So thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next Thursday. Till then. Thank <laughs> you.